Soul Hackers 2 was one of the first games I reviewed on this channel, and I've always wanted to find a reason to come back to it. Not just because I've gotten a lot better at editing since then, but because I really did love this game. Two full playthroughs and a platinum trophy and still I wanted more. Before starting a new playthrough for this video, I went back to my old review to see what my thoughts were at the time. I start that video with questions about choice, about how you might be totally up for an Atlas JRPG experience, but also how you might not want to play another 100 plus hour game. Then I go into a comparison between Soul Hackers 2 and its infinitely more famous older sibling, Persona 5. Even though I'm a big supporter of Soul Hackers 2, I still couldn't help comparing it to the game that overshadows it. Heck, I even outright called it Persona 5 Lite. Now you absolutely cannot deny that the Persona 5 DNA is alive and well in Soul Hackers 2. In fact, I'm a starter counter for every time I mention Persona 5 in this video. That one just now brings us to 4. That being said, here we have a game that is blatantly obviously made by the same people, and some comparisons are just unavoidable. But there is a lot this game does to carve out its own identity, and I think it's only fair that we talk about those things today, as we look into whether Soul Hackers 2 is worth your time. Now, did you bring your big book of fancy words? Because the opening sequence is going to probe more into the nature of consciousness and sentience than the entirety of Detroit Become Human ever did. And it's going to do it all within the first two minutes, before Ringo even opens her eyes, or as she calls them, the two tiny viewports. It's okay though, Ringo is hella smart, and she adjusts to her reality quickly, and she drops her reading level to one with a lot less syllables, probably because she doesn't want Fig and Flammer to think she's a huge dork and exclude her. Nerd! Right away, Soul Hackers is hitting different. It's very traditional JRPG fare in how heavy the exposition is, but you also start the game inside the internet, because it's alive and it lives under the sea, so that's one I've never heard before. The music has this delightful cyberpunkian wonder feel to it, and as you go from your internet base to a riverside shipping area, you have a strong contrast between the dystopian mundane and the sci-fi infused light bright future designs, which is something that is maintained for the rest of the game. Ringo and Fig are tasked with stopping the end of the world, and the first step is to absolutely make sure that these two very special people do not get killed. And it's gone! Uh, what? Maybe our heroines could have saved them if they hadn't spent so long talking about how smart they are and why they have bodies. Just a thought. It's okay though, because Ringo can bring her target back to life by hacking his soul. Ever wondered what a soul looks like? I can't say I have, but here we are. Again we get some superb music, mixing inquisitive feels with sci-fi, and more than a bit of a haunted vibe, as Ringo descends through a very techie representation of Arrow's soul. They have a chat, where Ringo is super matter-of-fact and approachable about the situation. And the situation dictates that I have to look like a person right now because, you know, reasons. And the whole thing just works. <laughs> Welcome back. As far as I'm concerned, Soul Hackers 2 has already established its own identity. And it's a good thing too, because you're about to jump into your first major deja vu, the combat. This is vintage Shin Megami Tensei stuff, but with enough tweak to make Soul Hackers feel like its own thing. Every time you hit an enemy weakness during your party's turn, you'll queue up a demon, and even if you only get one, you'll still get an automatic Sabbath at the end of your turn which is like an all-out attack in Persona 5. Not bad, right? The more demons you get, the more powerful the Sabbath is. Once again, special mention to the music. The battle theme is god-tier video game music. Probably the biggest complaint a lot of people had with Soul Hackers 2 is how basic it felt compared to Persona 5. I don't think this is entirely fair, but I don't think it's entirely wrong either. It's another one of those parroted internet opinions that doesn't tell the whole story. Soul Hackers 2 is a lot shorter than Persona 5. 
and while some of the shared elements are simplified, they also contribute towards Ringo and the gang forging their own identity. Like, you still have confidant hangouts, and you can still improve bond levels with your squad, but this is mostly done over shared meals and alcohol. You know, like in real life. But you also have the Soul Matrix, which is kind of like Mementos, only each area is tied to a specific party member. The more you bond with them, the further you can advance, and the more cool and lockable perks you can get. In my opinion, this is both a great twist on the confidant system, as well as an improvement on Mementos, giving you more regular and tangible rewards in an otherwise repetitive area. If you look at Shin Megami Tensei V, this is also an extremely basic game compared to the adventures of the Phantom Thieves. But in the time I've spent with it so far, SMT5 hasn't yet felt repetitive or lazy, and I have to admit that Soul Hackers eventually did. Does this make it a bad game? Not at all. To give another example, I've been playing bits of Persona 3 Reload lately, and I adore what I've played so far, despite it clearly being a much younger blueprint of the Persona 5 formula. Much like the adventures of Ringo and the gang, I find Persona 3 Reload to be a game built to fantastic standards that just so happens to be less complex than Persona 5. Solid mechanics are important, but you've got to have heart. And what keeps me coming back to Persona 3 Reload is a love of the characters and the music, and I'm very intrigued by the plot. Only a JRPG could make a compelling story about people turning into coffins for one hour every night. And this is what I was missing from Soul Hackers when I replayed it for this video. Because I already know the plot, I lost a little bit of the drive to keep going and find out what happens. All of that being said, remember that this is a much shorter game, and the bits that might feel a bit repetitive won't feel that way for long. Some of the quests might be a bit copy and pasty, but you can finish them pretty quickly. And honestly, my first time through, I was actually grateful for this, because I got very invested in the story and really wanted to know how it would end. So whilst I will absolutely admit that Soul Hackers 2 can sometimes feel a bit basic, I say again that that is not the whole story or completely fair. I'd also like to give full credit to the updates Atlas eventually added into the game, because they didn't exist when I first played it. There's a whole bunch of quality of life updates, like far more generous depth of field and character alignment options, and they also gave Ringo a dash button. If you played Soul Hackers 2 at launch, you'll understand how initially baffling it was that Ringo couldn't run. Maybe she was just getting used to the heels, I guess. Adding a simple on-off dash state has done wonders for this game. They also added in a speed modifier for the battles, and this helps enormously with any grindy feelings that might start to creep in. This last note will definitely rub some people the wrong way, but if you bought the DLC, you can add guaranteed item types to the spoils of every battle, and these will cut out most of the need to grind for demon skills or cash. I totally appreciate that this won't be for everyone, and I only mention it for completeness. The writing in Soul Hackers 2 is peak Atlas material. I'm your ass, and I don't fear no Reaper! I'm no Reaper, but I can send you to hell. So face the music, RS, and take the L. <laughs> okay, maybe not all the time, but because Ringo and Fig are hyper-intelligent learning computers, thrust into a world obsessed with vanity, mired by corruption, and largely stalled in terms of progress, your gang have some excellent conversations about what life is all about. These conversations generally happen in Arrow's apartment, or at this lovely wine bar. So either way, you get the pleasure of being serenaded by smooth jazz while you ponder the nature of things. It helps that of your three human party members, two are from opposing factions, and one is a highest bidder kind of guy, with shark teeth for some reason. Ah, uh, shark head. So you always get a discussion rather than the person with the loudest voice saying their way is the right way, even if some of the discussions do start this way. I also like how every action and opinion always seems to be thought through well enough that the writers are able to defend them from multiple angles, depending on who you choose to progress the conversations. You're an adult, and you'll deal with it. Like how in this scene, Melody defends her belief to end the world so that a better one can replace it by citing historical records indicating that this has happened before. Whilst this is initially scoffed at, Ringo then argues that basing decisions off folklore isn't as flaky as it might first seem, because folklore has to be developed over time, and you can't just plant or change it to suit your needs at a moment's notice. 
The story does get a little bit contrived in places, especially towards the end, but overall I was glad that I came along for the ride. Oh, and in case you were worried that you would miss out on Igor and the twins, letting you mix and match all your Pocasonas, well fear not. Soul Hackers 2 lets you pimp out your demons in a circus, with a super flamboyant ringmaster, because of course it does. In conclusion, Soul Hackers 2 is totally worth your time. If you're jonesing for more Atlas in your life and you slept on this one the first time, then let me assure you it has a lot to offer. On my first couple of playthroughs I was full on addicted, and parts of the soundtrack have been in my rotation ever since. Whilst I agree this game could have been more, what is here is still a lot of fun, and if it ever gets a surprise release for the Switch I will buy it again without any hesitation especially if the Phantom Thieves DLC is available with the pre-order, because I completely whiffed on this the first time. So not counting the Persona 3 references, this wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The counter wasn't in the original script you see, I ad-libbed while recording and decided to see it through, and I'm pretty happy that apparently I can give Soul Hackers 2 its time in the spotlight without constantly overshadowing it. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like, and maybe even subscribing to my channel. I'm on the socials too if you're into that sort of thing, or you just want to see pictures of my cat. And let me know in the comments if you played Soul Hackers 2, and what you thought about it. Thank you very much for watching guys, I appreciate every one of you, see you on the next one.